Now this presentation is going to be a little bit about jury nullification, also about who we are, where we are, and where we're going. If we get into where we're going. <laughs> now, first, we're the sovereigns. We're the sovereigns, not the judge, not the prosecutor. They work for us, not the other way around. They are, they are our agents. We are the masters. You own the corporation and the government that employs them. As a sovereign, you're enforcing the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, societal morals, and just plain common decency as a juror. The judge will tell, can tell you whatever he wants to about the facts and the law and what he commands you to do, but if the law violates any of the above, it is your duty to vote for acquittal. You are seated on the jury to keep them in line and look out for the accused and to be sure he or she gets justice in the system. Judges aren't the... The state didn't invent the jury system. We invented the jury system. And it's been incorporated into the, into the Constitution, a guarantee that we, that we may remain in control of our government. Now, to protect myself from legal consequences, I had to begin this presentation with a dis disclaimer. I'm not an attorney, and therefore, in the eyes of the government, I'm not qualified to offer legal service or advice. Therefore, I'm just discussing what I believe to be true. Do not act upon what I say without the advice of an attorney. They want their fees. I have a right to say what I want to about their malaprohibitum legal system, as long as I'm not offering legal advice. Malaprohibitum is Latin for it is prohibited. And malaprohibitum law is invented. There are no two legal systems in the United States. There's one for the lawyers and one for the people. Malaprohibitum for them, mala in say for us. The lawyer's system is statutory. It, is, it was invented for the political class by lawyer legislators in the state and Washington, D.C., legislatures with the, with the complicity of the court. The people system is a common or natural law which evolved through usage in people's common law courts overseen by citizen judges and tried in common law courts initially before the lawyers got the legislatures involved in reshaping American democracy at the local level. Up until about 1938, we lived in common law in the United States. And then with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he had to violate the common law to implement his socialist doctrine and his uh, social security and everything else. He had to... Uh, in order to do that, he had to have the, court, the Supreme Court on his side, and he threatened to pack the court at that time. And rather than be packed, the court decided to go along with Roosevelt, and they started passing his uh, legislation as constitutional, whereas in the, before that, they'd, vote, they'd considered it unconstitutional and wouldn't pass it. But his threats worked. Now, uh, we're no longer free men and women. We have to seek license to open a business. We have to grow before the city clerk to buy a building <coughs> permit to make additions or improvements to our own house. Our allodial titles have been stripped from us. We now rent our own property from the government by paying property taxes. An allodial title gives you absolute right to land without any obligation to any landlord, sovereign, or government. If you have a loyal title to a land, it cannot be seized. No government agency or bank can place any lien, attachment, or encumbrance on land sec secured by a loyal title. There are no disclaimers to a loyal title, period. It's yours and to do with what you want. But beginning, I guess, it was in the 1930s, uh, that's when we got the property taxes. And uh, the government seized our land, in effect. Uh, my son and I, we were, <laughs> in 1987, we were on a, a camping trip up in, uh, uh, by, uh, uh, in the, the Pine River country, which is up by Vanderbilt. And along the way, they had these po signs posted. It's an 85-mile trail. It's a circular trail. And along the way, they had these signs posted that said, this, land, this property is yours, common to the state of Michigan, was seized during the 1930s from people who couldn't pay their taxes. Yeah, and it made me feel real good. <laughs> but anyway, uh, since an individual cannot, now the common law, since an, and lawfully, since an individual cannot lawfully use force against the person, liberty, or property of another individual, then the common force, that's the, uh, the government, for the same reason cannot lawfully be used to destroy the person, liberty, or property of individuals or groups. Law allows you to do anything you want to as long as you don't infringe upon life, liberty, or property of anyone else. Law does not compel performance. When they refer to law, it's always common law. Because common law is natural law. It exists, it exists without the government. People come together over time to realize that in order to get along, they had to have rules to, to live by. And that's how the common law evolved. And until, like I say, the 1930s, it was pretty much what was ruled the United States. Now, under the common law, no peaceful person is subject to the jurisdiction or authority of any government derivative thereof or any agent thereof. No government derivative thereof or any agent thereof can compel a peaceful person to do anything, pay taxes, anything. 
No government or derivative thereof can be harmed by a citizen. The IRS can't come and get you because you've harmed the government under common law. <coughs> uh, no government may file charges against any person unless a citizen files a complaint and then they enforce the complaint filed by the citizen. How do we reclaim our rights? In the Declaration of Independence, Mr. Jefferson wrote, Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any government, form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. On November 13th in 1787, Mr. Jefferson also wrote to a man by the name of William Stephen Smith, and in part he said, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood and pat of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural measure. Now, we have the right to alter or abolish our government. We can do it in four different ways. We can do it on the soapbox, in the jury box, the, the ballot box, or the cartridge box. Now, we haven't gotten to the point of going to the cartridge box yet, when with Donald Trump as our president, it doesn't seem likely to be needed anytime soon, unless the Democrats and Antifa force us to do so to defend our homes and communities. The ballot box is too slow as it is the soap, as is the soap box. There's more expedient way, yet it is slow too, just more direct. It is jury nullification. Judges hate it and prosecutors do too. Too bad. Jury nullification is as old as the Republic, uh, as old as the Republic. Up until 1895, when the oligarchs and charlatans and black robes on the Supreme Court turned it upside down by ruling that it wasn't necessary for judges to advise juries of their right to nullify bad laws. Prior to that, it was accepted as part of the judge's instructions. The judge told the juries as a matter of course that they had the right to, it was within their power, it was in their rights to judge the law and the facts. Judges have powers, juries have rights. Governments have powers, states have powers. States do not have rights. Only people have rights. Everybody, everything else has powers. <clears throat> now the, uh, this was done, they, they, uh, they turned this on its head with, a, with the Spar versus U.S. decision in 1895. It was done in the decision upholding, the decision opinion ruling of Sparf, Sparf and Hansen versus the United States. The, 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 the judge said the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that all, oh, excuse me, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that although juries had the right to ignore a judge's instructions on the law, the jury shouldn't be aware of it, shouldn't be aware of it. Now this is from the Supreme Court. The judicial hypocrisy on this issue started with a decision that has never been changed. If it seems strange that citizens have a right they aren't supposed to know about, it is strange. Now why are they hiding that from us if it's our right? Because they have the power and they can do it if they want to. And the only thing, the only way that we can get it back is by through, through discussions like here tonight, uh, through uh, the ballot box, like well, hopefully this new Supreme Court Justice, Mr. Kavanaugh, will abide by the Constitution and, and enforce this, but who knows? He says he's going to, to rule by precedent. He's going to make his decision by precedent. Well, what if the precedent he's using is unconstitutional? But we'll have to wait and see. I hope, hope we don't, we're not disappointed. Now, uh, Lysander Spooner said uh, in his essay on the trial by jury, there are five separate tribunals to veto laws, representative, senate, executive, judicial, and jury. It's the right and duty of juries to hold all laws invalid that are unjust or oppressive in their opinion. If a jury does not have this right, the government is absolute and the people are slaves. It is absurd that 12 ignorant men should sit by and see the law decided erroneously. The justices are untrustworthy and are fond of power and authority. To allow them to dictate the law would surrender all property, liberty, and rights of the people into the hands of arbitrary power. And we saw this with the decision on uh, whether Obamacare was, was uh, constitutional or not. I don't know about you, but I could read the Constitution and tell you it wasn't constitutional. Because it, didn't, it wasn't just a tax at sea, it, it uh, what do you call it, nationalized the national health care system, everything. It took over. And that's not just a tax, that's a seizure. But Mr. Roberts said, oh, it's okay, it's constitutional because, and then he did a little flip-flop in his language to, to make it constitutional, which is what they do. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, back in 1942, there was Rickard, uh, I think it was Wickard, Wickard or Rickard, was a decision made by the Supreme Court that changed interstate, interstate commerce into intrastate commerce for control of the Congress. Before, the, the government could only uh, regulate, no, regulation when the Constitution was written was to make things regular, not to control, but made to make things regular so that the things would be smooth between the states. But the federal government re, uh, interprets the Constitution the way it wants to. 
so he can change the meaning of words. And one of the th ways that the judges changed, did it was they changed the meaning of interest, interstate to interstate, where now you have the EPA and all these other other this other you know sea of acronyms that are legislating it by through their through their own power rather than through the Congress. And uh, we have fined seventy one man was fined seventy five thousand dollars a day because he didn't he was uh, he had built a pond on his property and the EPA objected. Well, if it had gone to court, the trial jury would, it would be up to the trial jury then to decide whether the law was just or not and, and acquit. Now, the thing about jury nullification is there's acquittal and there's hanged juries. Now, acquittal is when everyone on the, the, the jury votes to acquit. That's an acquittal. Now, a hung jury is when one person on the, court, on the jury decides that the law is unjust, unfair, or whatever, and descend, will not change his vote. And then it's a hung jury. And when it's a hung jury, then the judge has the, uh, the uh, prosecutor has the option to retry the case and uh, cost the, the uh, defendant more money. Eventually, the guy's going to be broken. He won't be able to defend himself is what they plan on, I think. Now, uh, the difference uh, in, uh, now, where is it going? Well, anyway, that's the difference between a, 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 an acquittal and a, a hung jury. Now the, uh, oh, here's where we, and this also gets us into uh, double jeopardy. Now, the burden of proof is on the government to prove the, the uh, accused is guilty of some crime, uh, whatever the crime is. And now they have to rise to the level, they have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. What is a reasonable doubt? A reasonable doubt is con convincing all 12 jurors the government's case is valid. If they can't convince 12, it fails that test. They have not convinced anyone beyond a reasonable doubt. One person is reasonable doubt. And then, they, then the, the judge says, well, I have the power to retry the case because it was not a unanimous acquittal. That's not right. If the jury's hung, the state could not prove its case 100 proof to the satisfaction of the jurors, so it should not, double jeopardy should apply, and the person, whoever it is, should walk free, period. But that's uh, the lawyers and lawyerese, they play these little games with the words to get what they want to change our, the way we do things. Now, uh, oh, no, I don't tell, oh, yes, uh, inaugural, let's see, Chief Justice John Jay, in his inaugural decision for the Supreme Court, said it will be sufficient to observe briefly that the sovereignties in Europe, and particularly in England, exist on feudal principles. That system considers the prince as a sovereign and the people as his subjects. It regards his, personal, his person as the ob object of the allegiance and excludes the idea of his being on an equal footing with a subject, either in a court of justice or elsewhere. No such ideas obtain here. At the revolution, the sovereignty devolved on the people and they are truly the sovereigns of the country. But they are sovereigns without subjects and have none to govern but themselves. Now, I don't know how they can say it any plainer than that. And that's a Supreme Court decision. Now, the we, the people, in order, now this is uh, from the, the, uh, our Bill of Rights, or not from our Bill of Rights, but from our Constitution. We, the people of the United States, doesn't say this, originally started out as the 13 states, they just named all the states, but they couldn't work because if one of the states abstained, then they'd have to rewrite it, so they wrote we, the people, instead. And we, the people, actually means we, the people, through our states, do ordain and establish this Constitution. And in Michigan, Article One of our Bill of Rights says, First, doesn't say number one, it says first. It's written out first. All political power is inherent in the people. Second is right of the people. Government instituted for the protection, security, and benefit of the people, and they have the same right at all times to alter or reform the same and to abolish one form of government and establish another whenever the public good requires it. And this is why where jury nullification comes in, is that if the state if the government oversteps its bounds by passing laws that are unconstitutional, just cruel, which can, well, like uh, somebody getting life imprisonment for, stoke, for taking a toke on a joint. That's happened. Now, I don't think that that's quite just. They don't need, the drunk on the street doesn't get that much time. After he gets a ticket. So there's something, there's some un, un, unbalance there. And some of the states are starting to acquit on that now. The, the juries are starting to overturn those, uh, those uh, uh, prosecutions. 
prohibition from the 1930s failed in part because people stopped convicting their neighbors of drinking a beer. The government would take him to court and say, he drank a beer, he's got to go to jail. The jury would say, well, I'm sorry, but we're not going to convict him. Because you know, I don't know what the sentence was. It could have been six months or, well, if the government takes you to court, it's going to be more than six months. It's not going to be for some minor infraction. So it was uh, probably a year or more in jail for tra taking a beer. And that's, that's partly the, why prohibition failed was because the people stopped supporting it. And also it's an illustration of what happens when you get a block of people who have enough influence to either buy the politicians or blackmail them or cudgel them into passing a law, which happened with a pro prohibition. Because uh, prohibition by itself was to ban the, the uh, use of liquor, not beer, not wine, but liquor, hard liquor. But they took and they interpreted it to mean all, any, any alcohol to be consumed. Now, uh, I haven't got anything else that I can think of to cover uh, under common law. And, uh, but, uh, my, well, my favorite is common law because it illustrates what we had but once. We no longer have it. We, you can, if you know the law, well, here, there are three types of law. Uh, let me see. There are three laws. There's a common law, the law, and there is uh, equity and admiralty. Common law is the law where you have to have do harm to another person before it can be enforced. Uh, the equity law is where a person has a complaint against somebody else, and they can take it to that court, and then it, it goes to a, a, a jury. But it's not a punishment court. Admiralty is the law of the sea, and it can, it can it has, uh, under admiralty law, I guess you can be hanged. But uh, that's the three types of law. It's, they're all in the Constitution. All three of them are mentioned in the Constitution. And supposedly, with the common law was so ensconced in American way of doing things is that we were going to have that forever. They didn't think to write it into the... They thought that because it was a part of the Constitution in itself that it would last forever. The Constitution is a common law document, as are the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights are to protect our common law rights. That's what they were written for. And the Constitution itself was written by men living under common law. But Alexander Hamilton and some of those boys, they decided that uh, they wanted the government to be more powerful. They were the Federalists. And that's how we got John, uh, not John Jay, but uh, how we got John Marshall as a, a Supreme Court, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And that's how we got judicial review was through him. He decided that the Supreme Court was superior to the other two branches. So now the Supreme Court tells the executive and the legislative branches whether the laws are even valid or not. And the founders did not have that in mind when they, when they, invented, when they invented our, our country. It was supposed to be co-equal branches and uh, the balance of powers was shared amongst them so they could control each other. But now the Supreme Court has sole, there I call them uh, the uh, oligarchs. It's an oligarchy of men who have final power. They, they say that they have the final word in the, the, the interpretation of the words of the Constitution. And it's not, it's not mentioned anywhere in the Constitution itself. And Justice Scalia in 1999 admitted in a, uh, a speech at uh, Catholic University that there's no mention, if you look for it in the Constitution, of the Supreme Court having the final word on the Constitution. We just took it, quote unquote, we just took it. So that they know what's going on, they know what they did. And uh, that's uh, probably all that I've got to say, unless anyone has any questions, or do you want me to fill up more time somehow? <laughs> no. Well, yeah. Well, that's my nerves. That's my nerves. We won't hurt you. I know. I know. I'm sorry. Are you a member of the FIJA? No. No, I did. I didn't. I never became a member because I didn't want to be asked by the uh, in voir dire if I was ever called for jury if I was a member of any organization. Did you get what? I didn't want to be. I didn't want the in voir dire. They they might ask voir dire's where they uh, question the jury before they impanel them yeah. to to to, to uh, cut out whoever they don't want to be on the jury or to see who they want to be on the jury. It's jury packing is what it is. Jury stacking. They try to stack the jury in their favor. And uh, I didn't want some prosecutor or, 
or anyone or uh, lawyer to ask me if I belonged to or knew of any uh, organization that uh, advocated uh, jury nullification. But then I became 70 years old and no longer applied <laughs> because they don't, they don't call anybody that's over 70 years old in Macomb County. Um, I guess we fall asleep on the, <laughs> on the jury, on the panel. <laughs> but uh, no, Fiji is a good outfit though, it is. That's where I got a lot of my information from for tonight's presentation. Yeah, I, I, I forgot to bring my brochure. I, I know it was originally uh, in Montana, uh -huh. and I think they moved yes. their headquarters, didn't they? I'm not sure. I don't know. So you can still get their brochure, right? Uh, no, I don't get anything from them anymore. I, I've I, went, got, I got one at home. I went online. I have uh, in my uh, bag, I've got about 15 of their uh, jury advocacy uh, uh, newsletters from 1985 or something like that. <laughs> Years ago, but what's the uh, organization again? Uh, fully informed jury association. Right. That's now, what you're talking about tonight, right? I mean, yes, that's that's part of that's it. What you're talking now the about. Uh, that's the name of it. That's what it's called. That's what it stands for. Now you have this. Uh, fully informed, fully informed uh, jury association. Yeah, you can go online and, and you should be able to get information on it. Uh, well, here's something I can cover. Bill of Rights. Okay. Equity. Now this is in your, uh, the flyers I handed out tonight, and uh, one of them is about uh, verbally counter-offering a government's agent's notice to you. What do you do when you talk to the government? Nothing. Don't say anything. Shut up. <laughs> the more you talk, the more they, uh, let's say, uh, uh, these are the only words that you should say to any official in writing or otherwise, especially any type of judge magistrate. To any question, your only response is, I do not understand. This has the effect of stating to them that you do not stand under their jurisdiction because you're a sovereign and do not recognize your jurisdiction over you. If you say anything other than I do not understand or especially answer a question, you set the jurisdiction right there and establish who's in charge and pretty much confess your guilt. This remains the same even if you're asked, would you like something to eat? A telephone call, mail, a visit from your wife or dear mother, bail, to speak with a bondsman or a bar fly. What time is it? Would you like to go home? Don't. By answering any of those questions, you can, you can fall under the jurisdiction. That's the, the trick is you have to know the language of the court. If you know the language of the court, then you're sunk. And uh, it's, uh, it's, all, it's very specific. Every word has a meaning. And that's, that's why lawyers go to school for four years after they graduate from college to get an education law. And uh, prior to, I don't remember what data was, but in Michigan before, all you had to do to get your law license was pass the bar. You didn't have to go to a, an established or accredited college. Now you have to be a graduate of an accredited college to get your license to practice in Michigan, which is how this is why they, they can charge such exorbitant rates. There's no competition. There's no competition in the law. None. It belongs to lawyers and the judges. This is, uh, it's all, I believe myself is all planned that way. But you can and you represent yourself, though, can Pardon? Yeah. Foolishly oh yeah, pro se, you can do that. Yeah, yeah. But if you do, you'd better know what you're doing. Yeah. Because uh, if all you got to do is answer the wrong question at the right time, and bingo, you're under their jurisdiction. So you have to be very careful. Uh, I have something that printed off the computer. What's that? So I could harass you. <laughs> uh, this lady wrote uh, a nice column, right? Mm -hmm. She is a justa columnist. Is the CEO of Justice Wong? Professor, uh, professor of law at Cornell Law School. And I just want to read part of the thing that she wrote. Mm -hmm. Conclusion. When I heard that the woman in the radio lab story was prosecuted for proposing nullification, mm -hmm. I must admit that I was outraged by that. I have never liked nullification, mm -hmm. but it seems to me that the jury trial does have reasonably Intel the power to nullify. We should not be punishing jurors for understanding that they have power, even if we prefer they do not exercise it. I do not regard nullification as a right, and I oppose the idea of telling jurors mm -hmm. that they can nullify, as I explained here. I suppose this creates some arbitrariness because many jurors will know of their power to nullify while others will not. Nonetheless, I think we should seek to minimize 
the practice of nullification because it seems more likely to be misused as in date rape prosecutions than justly used as in fugitive slave law prosecution. Well, people don't like jury, some people don't like jury nullification because they don't trust their fellow Americans. Americans aren't stupid. When you're in panel on a jury, they don't put, well, they, they try to get uh, people on there who aren't familiar with the law. But the thing is that Americans are uh, conscientious people, they're moral people, and they know what's going on. They've got half an idea what's going on. So if some judge is trying to, now there's one uh, that I, thing that I read, some woman was very, she was in tears because she had to convict some man for pot possession and send him to jail for years because a judge told him they had to follow the law. They could not vote their conscience. A judge can't see in your head. He can't tell what you're thinking. If you, if, you, if you feel like voting because you had a bad day, if you feel like nullifying it, you can. Because they can't see what's in your head. They just, you, all you have to do is say, well, it did not rise to the level of, uh, of uh, uh, what do you call it, a reasonable doubt. Not overcome reasonable doubt. That's why I voted not guilty. He didn't prove he was guilty. Same thing as saying, I don't understand. They can't get past that. You cannot be, you cannot be called... Once the jury is once the jury has de decided its verdict, it cannot be overturned. That's it, and that they always they try to weed out. And if this, if uh, someone, uh, if you're if you ha are, have knowledge of jury nullification, and you're sitting in the court, don't tell anybody. If you're sitting on a jury, don't tell. Keep it to yourself. You don't want to every because because. The jury foreman, he might not like jury nullification. He might want to get out of there. He don't want to sit around debating all the, for days because somebody's voting to acquit. And everybody's trying to convince him not to, not, not to acquit. So you have to be careful if you have knowledge of, ju of, um, of jury nullification. And the judge, lawyers will tell you it's not your right. They'll say that you have to do what the judge says. They can't see what's going on in your brain. That's one thing, that's one thing. But the other thing is that they don't tell you what your rights are, and they cannot tell you that you don't have a right. Now, if you, if you believe you have a right, then, you, then it's up to you to enforce it. And if you believe that the person, uh, that the, they're prosecuting a person wrongfully, if you believe that the, the sentence is going to be too strong or too much, then you vote to acquit. If uh, my own self, if I ever sit on a jury, and they brought in and they said, Mr. Jones, uh, what did, what did the government offer you to testify against this man? Well, Your Honor, I was uh, up for a 20-year sentence on uh, possession, and they just said that they'd let me off if I testified against him. But I'm, but I'm telling the truth. Yeah, uh-huh, sure. The minute they said that, I would vote to acquit, period. I would, that's uh, insanity. The, but the, that's how the, the government gets 95% conviction in their cases, and that's how they do it. That's one of the ways that they do it. And now uh, there was a, Doreen Hendrickson was a young lady who was convicted of, uh, of not refusing to perjure herself on a government document. The IRS said, you have to sign it this way. And she said, no, I will not, because if I do, I'll perjure myself. The judge sends her to time for uh, contempt of court. And uh, the, sh the first time was a hung jury. Well, it wasn't unanimous, so they tried her again. This time, they didn't allow her to introduce the evidence she had in the first court. The first hearing, she was restricted on what she could present as evidence because the other evidence was exculpatory and they knew it. That's the only reason I can think of. And I, I was there for the second here for the second trial, and they brought in they brought the prosecutors in from Washington D.C. to try this woman in a Detroit courthouse. There was like 75 people showed up to for support for her. There, the the jury the uh, the gallery was filled, and it was flowing out into the hallway. And we thought maybe we could head, you know, if there are enough of us there, maybe we might influence something. But no, uh, the jury was not instructed that it could uh, nullify the law. And that's, that, well, that's uh, federal and state now. They don't have to tell you in the state either. Some states have passed laws that require <coughs> the judge to tell the jury that they have the power of nullification. They have to tell them that in some states. Michigan, I don't think, is one yet. But that's something, yes, sir. Michigan, that's what? Michigan isn't one yet. Right, right. Well, you can do it, but the judge won't tell you about it. 
See, it's all up to you. And uh, you know, like I said, now. Has county ever done jury nullification that you know of? In St. Clair County? No, no county that I know of, no. It's a state, it's, yeah, it's usually a state issue that they, that, they get a, that they try. There are several states now that have passed jury nullification laws that require the judge to tell the jury that uh, they have the power to nullify. Yeah. I know when I represented myself in court to uh, father of equal rights when I went to my divorce, I made the judge's ears get red many a time. <laughs> I'm sorry? I made the judge's ears get red many a time. Oh, okay. I represented myself in court for my divorce. Mm -hmm. he, he was hot to try half the time. <laughs> Well, they don't. They don't think a layman. They don't like it. Yeah, they don't think a layman understands the law. And uh, well, the thing oh, is that there are a lot of stupid. Yeah, they think we're all stupid. That's it. Folks, good. So mm -hmm. if you're in the jury room mm -hmm. and the judge says you can't do this uh, nullification, but you can do it. You sure. Quit. You yes. can. Mm -hmm. Even you if can he do. Does it. Not. Even if he tells you you can't, because once that, once that verdict is in, it can't be changed. Mm -hmm. Unless it's a hung jury and then the judge can decide whether to retry it or not. And, uh, is that the, why that one kid couldn't get justice on TV? He was 18 years old, he was in for 30 years, he was on TV here several times. Mm -hmm. And the, he, he was proven innocent, mm -hmm. but I don't think it ever got overturned. It's, 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 that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, right. So right, they yeah. can never really mm -hmm. overturn that death. No. Well, they, they could. I think Lansing got involved up there and tried to help him, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... Uh, uh, Remember what case I'm talking about? The whole, the whole thing is, the whole idea between, behind both... One of Fiji's uh, strategies is that if we, over, if we uh, stall enough of these prosecutions, the, the legislatures will realize that they're not what the people want in force and they will repeal the laws. What happened in Prohibition, for, like I was saying before, Prohibition in the, because of that partly. Your emphasis tonight is on common law. My emphasis on common law because uh, I realized that I wasn't a free man, mm -hmm. and I was trying to find out what it meant to be a free man. Mm -hmm. And our common law, common law is a law of freedom, statutes a law of oppression, mm -hmm. and they use statutes to control your behavior. Under common law, they could not pass laws that you couldn't be forced to do anything against your will. And a peaceable person, I should, I should. Uh, Pre preface that with a peaceable person. A peaceful person cannot be made to do anything against their will. If you, if you violate the, the law, then you can be made to do something, like go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> but as long as you're peaceful, you can do whatever. My contention is that all rights are involved circle around one principle, and that is peaceful, peaceful conduct. If you're a peaceful person, you can do anything you want. As long as you don't hurt anybody. If you don't hurt anybody, you're a peaceful person. I can't find anything, anything wrong. Well, you see these, uh, I, I can understand how statutory law got started because if you, the old westerns you see on TV, they always have a bordello and a and gambling house all over town. Well, it's because they didn't have to be licensed. And so it was a lady like, what was her name, Carrie Nation got, got together with some of her friends and got prohibition passed. And we saw what a disaster that was, uh, moralizing for other people through constitutional law. And... Uh, it, that was what put the, uh, got the mafia uh, to be as strong as it was. And uh, probably a sad at hand in assassinating a president. But uh, so con trying to control people's conduct this doesn't work out. I can't see how it does. It it's always gets. Rolling with the gun at your head. Yeah, well. If you don't do hmm? what they say you should do. Oh, well, you. Yeah. Forcing you to pay, pay certain taxes. And if you don't pay it. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I see, yeah, house. right, yeah, yeah, right. So if the government should Yeah, that's, a, that's it, and the, the uh, according to common law, the government cannot use force against you unless you break the law. Buckley used to point that out. Uh, uh, William Buckley. Uh, Fiji? Huh? Uh, support what? William Buckley. Oh, Buckley? Buckley? Oh, yeah, Buckley, he was a character. <laughs> he was what? He was a character. He was. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, does anyone have any more questions or anything? I was just going to make a comment. When sure. You said, Don't say anything yeah. if uh, mm -hmm. the government asks you questions or that. The other thing I say, you can do the same thing to a lawyer when he's questioning you. Just keep saying, I don't mm -hmm. understand. I don't understand. Yeah. 
and that will really rattle them. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> no. They put on trying to understand it. Yeah. I don't understand. Or if they ask you the same question in two or three different ways. Oh, they always do. If I yeah. answer them once, I tell them I already told you, and that's all. And if they ask me again, I'll say I told you, and I don't keep asking me again because I'm not giving you a different answer. Yeah. I did that to one guy, and I drove him nuts. <laughs> <laughs> now, this... Uh, uh, three. This is five, seven pages in all. Fiji and the jury nullification. Don't get mad, get even. This tells you what to do in court if you're ever called for jury duty. Tells you how to conduct yourself in the courtroom so that uh, you'll get on the jury without uh, without uh, any hassle. Like now, sometimes it, sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll if you admit it they'll they'll put you on a jury anyway. Depends on what the prosecutor and the. Uh, what do you call the, the defense lawyer trying to do? Who knows? Yeah. But 99% uh, of the time you say, well, I, I, I understand uh, fully informed jury. Does that have anything to do with it? You're out of here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or just tell them that you can't make a judgment until you hear all the evidence. That's right. That's all. I mm -hmm. can't. How yeah. can I know how I'm going to vote That's or right. answer? It's mm -hmm. up to the... Mm -hmm. People to present their well, cases well they'll ask you questions like, uh, could, you, uh, can, could you send this man to death if he's guilty of the crime? They'll ask questions like that, not here in Michigan, but in uh, states that had the death penalty. They'll ask the jury if they'd be capable of convicting someone of the death penalty. Myself, I wouldn't be able to because I don't think the government should have. They make too many mistakes. <laughs> too many innocent people have been. Uh, and jury. What's that? I didn't think they could ask you that. How would yeah, they can, that? sure. Well, the, the thing is, when you go to for what they call voir dire, when you go, that's when the, the, the court uh, uh, tests you for whether you're going to make a good juror or not. And the court and the defense are going to try to stack the jury with people yeah. that they think is going to agree with them. Right. And so the, the, the lawyer has so many challenges and the, the government has so many challenges. And if they're not met, then whoever they decide to seat gets seated. Right. And Oh yes, yes, yes. Attorneys do, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. When now, they called me for a jury, I told I told the one gal that called me. I said, you know, I don't know if I could agree with the judge, and that did. She, I told her that twice, and she didn't call me back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she didn't call me back anymore. Well, it used to be in, uh, that common law, you accuse your neighbor of something, you know, damaging your barn. You know, he. He uh, took an axe and cut down a tree in my yard. Well, then you'd make a complaint. The sheriff serves the complaint. And then uh, the, the goes to court, goes to trial. And a judge was picked from amongst the, the elders of the village, the wisest man. They picked for the, to be the judge. And uh, the prosecutor, the, the attorneys, uh, the acting attorneys, were from the village or wherever. And they stood in for because there weren't any, they didn't have lawyers and judges back then. They, uh, so they did it themselves, and this is business about the old west having full of vigilantes. That's bunch. Of, that's Hollywood. That's Hollywood. There were there may have been some vigilantes. I'm not saying there weren't, but most of the law in the west was conducted on common law basis. And uh, like uh, uh, like I say, you know, they had bordellos and uh, casinos in town, and the ladies on Sunday would get together and they'd try to close them down and stuff like that. But uh, they re eventually they reached a, a compromise and they had one part of town was where that was and the other part of town was for the good folks, I guess, other, other than uh, the, the occasional bar or two. Well, we used to have opium dens in yes. Michigan, didn't we? Yes, we did. We, throughout the country, mm -hmm. but I remember talking about opium dens. A lot of the families on the East Coast made their money in the opium trade in a, around the turn of the 19th century, the 18th century rather, 18th and 19th century, yeah. Well, I won five cases in court with uh, a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> and one thing you learn with lawyers is they say, well, you can't do that. You say, I'm hiring you to do that. Uh -huh. That's what I want you to do is to take care of this for me yeah. mm -hmm. and don't tell me you can't do it because they want the money. They'll do whatever yeah. you tell them. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's uh, about all I have to say. I can't think of anything else. Uh, everything, like I say, this is this is a pretty good, it's like a, if you want to get on a jury brochure, uh, this is it, this little one here. 
And this was uh, taken from uh, the antique canna cannabis bookstore. Cannabis. <laughs> so that's where that uh, little brochure was downloaded from. But, uh, so with that, I guess I'll have to end the, the uh, lecture. I hope I didn't talk too fast, but this is the first time I've done this in several years. So. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the patience of listening.